And welcome to the Saturday morning wake-up call right here on KFAR. We are local talk radio, 660 on your AM dial and online at KFAR660.com. I'm Steve Floyd, the monkey behind the machine, basically here just to make sure that all the buttons get pushed. And uh, your buttons as well. That's kind of what we're here for. It's a wake-up call in more ways than one. Joining me here in the studio, the sponsors of the show from Far North Tactical, Aaron Bennett. Good morning, Aaron. Good morning, Steve. And from Bighorn Enterprises, Josh Bennett. Good morning, Josh. Good morning. <coughs> How are you doing today? You know, you know what? I had some kind of small amphibian crawl into my throat overnight. It might be a frog. I'm not sure. So I've got a little bit of that uh, scratchy thing going on. So forgive me if I start hacking up a lung at some point in the show. Nice. Uh, did you guys get the story this morning from Guns.com? You hear about this? That Ooh, some no. unidentified ATF agent or someone identifying himself as an ATF agent has been asking Alaskan gun shop owners for their sales records? And you've got a look on your face like, what? Uh, what? That could not. Now, uh, Aaron, obviously over there at Foreign North Tactical, you guys sell guns, and you do have, uh, with your your FFL, your, your federal firearms license, you're required to maintain records of some sort for a certain period of time, but they're not supposed to be part of a registry, are they? No, no. Um, ATF has the right to come in and go uh, review them all to make sure that they're done properly, but not to copy them and take them or anything like that. Well, here, Examiner.com has reported that an ATF agent walked into Great Northern Guns, I guess that's what, down in Anchorage? That's down in Anchorage. Last month and asked the store owner, Frank Caeza, to turn over all of his sales records dating back to 2007. And he told the agent right to his face, boom, uh, no, you don't have the right to do that. You do not have the legal right to do that. Apparently, the ATF agent was trying to get Anchorage store owners to relinquish their firearms transaction records or Form 4473s. That's the official document that you have to fill out when you uh, get a firearm from an FFL. It's not technically considered to be a registration form, but rather a sales form that contains one's name, address, date of birth, a copy of one's ID, the result of the NICS background check, the make and model and the serial number of the firearm and a signed affidavit that the purchaser is eligible to own the gun under the federal law. I don't normally follow a lot of the paperwork when I purchase a firearm. Uh, you know what? Often I will, when I do purchase a firearm, I try to do one uh, from a, an individual or, you know, anonymously. Why? And so, <laughs> I, just, I just, I don't like the idea of somebody getting my information at all. And this is the kind of thing that makes people get jumpy about it. When an ATF agent shows up, you know, they're allowed to inspect the, 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 the bound book or request a form only during a criminal investigation to try to get those sales records. What's he doing? Is he is he committing some kind of a violation? I have no violation? That sounds like a very isolated incident, Steve. Okay. Well, at least the guy told him no. The guy told him no. It doesn't sound like every gun shop in town's screaming about it. Well, then that's the, the point here on guns.com. They're, they they urge in terms of uh, ac- actionable points. They said spread the word. Tell your local gun store to be wary of strange requests from the ATF officials, but you're already wary of strange requests, aren't you? I can say, see by the smirk on your face that you get some strange requests from time to time. Mainly from the FBI asking for records. Which, what, what do you tell them when they ask for records? We don't have any. But aren't you required to keep records? You can go buy them down at Walmart. Oh, <laughs> no. Pretty not, much. Pretty much. Not vinyl don't. records. I mean, you silly don't man. Keep any records for any um uh, anything bought or sold outside of uh, firearms. So uh, have fun finding a record. You know, I haven't I haven't bought a record in boy, it's got to be at least thirty years. Uh, well, so so you're basically your 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 response to this is just kind of like eh, no big deal, nothing to worry about here. Uh, but I ultimately I only have to worry about my own shop, and nobody's getting our records. If other people want to give them up, I suppose they're going to do whatever they want to do. Well, but what about it, the average gun owner? I mean, the average gun owner doesn't have anything to worry about, right? I mean, the the records that are kept are only kept for how long? And aside from that, why would the average gun owner even have to worry about it anyway? What if the government came and got their record? Well, then they would know who has the guns. Why would that matter? Well, then they could come and round the guns up. This is this is this is part of the machine that gets fed all the time. Every time we have an election year, people get all upset that somebody's going to come and try to take your guns. Whether it's the the Democratic Party is going to come take your guns, or the uh, the Republicans are going to send your kids off to war. It's just it's the same kind of rhetoric that just keeps getting ginned up over and over again. 
But when you hear a report of an ATF agent actually asking for records that he does not have any legal right to have, it does get one a little upset. I suppose if you um, view firearms as your way to liberty, then sure, you need to worry about it. If you equate firearm ownership to freedom, then you need to worry about it. I know that most right-wing Republican Americans do equate owning firearms to freedom. Well, the Second Amendment. How, how, Second how do Amendment they figure that out? How does anybody figure that a firearm is their, is their key to liberty? You, you want me to Isn't that the general speculate? mentality? Well, yeah, it is. It's that, that the Second Amendment protects all of our other rights. Mm-hmm. It's I, been doing pretty good, hasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Woo. How's that working out for America? How'd that America? work in... Uh, well, we have we have total freedom of speech, right? How Nobody did that gets... work in every other country? You have to take that from a historical standpoint and ask how that worked in any other country. How'd that work in Nazi Germany? They owned guns. They're some of the oldest manufacturers of firearms ever. The Russian people owned guns at one time. So how did the government end up getting the guns, or did they just the guns stayed in the closet they while they didn't? You're you're telling me that the average German family had guns in their closet while the Nazis were roaming the streets? Absolutely. So the Jews. So, so, did the, so did the Jews. They never came and took firearms from the Jews. They made it a crime by death to carry a gun and be Jewish. To carry a gun. What if I? Normally carry a gun and just decided to be Jewish for a day or two. You know, can I do that? Well, Steve, I've done money transactions with you. I'm pretty sure. The, well, what? I, <laughs> whoa! Wow, that was probably the most insensitive thing that I have ever. No, it's not. I've heard you say a lot more things. Uh, wow, <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> I think the point we've talked about it before. What? Getting up in a rile about the Second Amendment. I mean, Aaron and I both love guns. You know that. Anyone who I, knows us knows we I've love like guns. I've seen the like guns in your house. Yeah, I know you love guns. Whoa. But the f- <laughs> not healthy. Well, okay. But the uh, but sit there. The only time people get worked up, especially with uh, conservatives, the only time we get worked up about our rights being taken away is when they talk about the Second Amendment. What about all the other rights that we have? Who cares about the Second Amendment? They're hiding in your closet. Bull crap. crap. Now. Before they come take your guns, you will not do anything when they come if they came to take your guns. Why would they even come to take your guns? Why do they care if you have guns? They're doing just fine without them. There's something that you've said in the past which I think applies to this very particular situation, that we are the best armed slaves in in the history history. of the world. Yep, the most well-armed slaves in the history of the world. So we have a whole bunch of guns. Who cares? They do whatever they want anyways. I mean, the whole point of... Well, let's take a little, let's do a little, you mind if I read Federalist 46 real quick? Oh, you're fine. I know. <laughs> it's reading. People don't like that. No, I, I love Federalist 46. That's a, that's a catchy one. Federalist 46 by James Madison. Let a regular army fully equal to the resources of the country be, oh, my computer just died. What the heck? <laughs> Sorry. Technical difficulties. James Madison. Let a regular army fully equal to the resources of the country be formed, and let it be entirely at the devotion of the federal government. Still, it would not be going too far to say that the state governments, with the people on their side, would be able to repeal the da- repel the danger. The highest number to which, according to the best computation, this, we've got to remember this is back in the 1700s. Back when late. people actually knew Compute what big words what? meant. Yeah, we well, sure. The highest number of which, according to the best computation, a standing army can be carried in any country does not exceed one hundredth part of the whole number of souls or one twenty-fifth part of the number able to bear arms. This proportion would not yield in the United States any an army of more than twenty-five or 30,000 men. So back then, the, the argument was having a federal army. And the anti-federalists said no. The Federalists said, yes, we need an army. So Madison's saying, even if we did, it's going to equal up to about twenty-five to 30,000 men. To these would be opposed a militia amounting to nearly half a million of citizens with arms in their hands, officered by men chosen among themselves, fighting for their common liberties, and united conducted by governments possessing their affections and confidence. It may well be doubted whether a militia thus circumstanced could ever be conquered by such a proportion of regular troops. Okay, no, wait a second. Ever be conquered? The, the, the whole point of a militia is to keep foreign armies out. I mean, how could we possibly project American force around the world without having a standing army? How could we possibly send our troops to places like Haiti or Bosnia or Germany 
or Japan or Iraq or Afghanistan or Somalia or Grenada? Can, shall I keep going? <laughs> How could we possibly do that if we didn't have a standing army? We need a standing army or else we will not be able to project our force around the world. Or maybe we shouldn't be projecting our force around the world. No. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that, that would be the better part of it. No. It's interesting. In this Federalist 46, the guy that actually wrote this article about Madison, at the very end of it, this is the the, the author writing the column. He quoted Madison. Now he writes at the end. So pray tell, would today's FBI categorize James Madison's statements in Federalist 46 as seditious conspiracy? What well, I think it's funny if you. Um, Put it into perspective, especially in the 21st century, you don't have governments using their military against people anyway. You no, have, you have your FBI's no, you marshals. Don't even, you don't even need that anymore. You've got your neighbor. If you see <laughs> if you see something, say something. Turn in your neighbors, folks. Hey, oh, well, look, it's an unattended backpack. Turn the, it in. The Nazis didn't use uh, conventional army, the Wehrmacht. They didn't use a those people against the people not in any instance that i've seen from studying history not one time they used the army against their own people they didn't even use the army against in a death squad role against foreign peoples those people came after them and those people that were being used were the 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 special the agents, police the, the special forces mm -hmm. like, federal uh, police federal police in other words mm -hmm. exactly <laughs> Interesting. Very, very interesting. I, I'd like to bring up a point real quick since we're on this, the topic. You have something like our military, and of course people like to equate all government as being the same in their mind, but you take a federal marshal and you take a American soldier, an American soldier takes an oath to the Constitution, right? I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all federal enemies foreign and domestic. A federal marshal takes an oath to... Presidente. The president. Are you kidding me? Really? I thought he had to take an oath to the Constitution, too. I don't, do, too. Don't elected, don't elected officials have to take a, an oath to the Constitution? Because that would be a problem. Elected if, officials do. I don't know if federal law... You, I think federal law enforcement has to, but I think they also have... They take an oath, to, take an oath to, to the president. To the president. When I'm not saying that they don't take an oath to the Constitution, but... You're saying in addition to that, they take an... How do you know that? Well, enlisted soldiers do also. Whoa, whoa. Only, only uh, officers don't. I don't think officers take an oath to the president, but enlisted do. I never took an oath to the president. To the Constitution. And to the, the Constitution. And the direction of the president. I well, I mean, the 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 first standing order is that you will obey all lawful orders, and obviously down the chain of command, the president of the United States is at the top of that. However. It's lawful. You have to. It has to be a lawful order. I mean, every American soldier is inculcated with that idea that you can only obey lawful orders. If somebody tells you to go in and massacre a village, and you know in your heart that that's wrong, you have a moral duty to refuse that command. Is indefinite detention for American citizens lawful? I don't think it is, and I know an awful lot of soldiers that don't think it is it's legal. either. It's legal now. There are an awful lot of things that are legal that are immoral, and an awful lot of things that are moral that are illegal. While we're on the presidency, let's shift gears a little bit. I think we've beat that <laughs> once up a little bit. Okay. So, I have a lot of friends, a lot of disgruntled friends that are starting to see on the national level that um, Ron Paul's obviously not going to win, whether no. honestly what? or dishonestly, no he's not going to win. So you have this mass amount of people, even <laughs> Democrats, that have basically signed up to become Republicans, right? Yeah. You included. Me included. <laughs> <laughs> so now you have the Republican Party who knows for a fact that, I mean, in their mind, that Ron Paul didn't even have a chance. So I'm going to drown the, myself in the river after the show. <laughs> I will hold you down. <laughs> <I'll watch. laughs> you have um, basically all the rhetoric coming out of the uh, right side, the Republican side is, you know, well, now that you're all Republicans, you got to do your duty. Get in line. You got to do your line. duty. No. You got to vote for Mitt Romney. This is, may I just, as an aside, this is precisely why I refused to jump on the Ron Republican train. <laughs> I, I, I refused to join up to the Republican Party just so I could support Ron Paul because 
This is precisely the sort of thing that I saw happening, not not in, in terms of a, a prescient way of, oh, I see it happening in the future, but uh, swearing fealty to a party in order to support a person, I, I think is this, the way that you get people like Hitler in power. Right, but... Right. I didn't become a Republican, though. I mean, I can care less about the party. You signed, I, I you, signed a piece of paper. Up. I can unsign a piece of paper, too. I'm a Trojan horse, baby. And that's, right. that's the only reason I went in there. And Try to convince Republicans so to quit people, being Republicans. That's why so many people went in there. But you take your average guy out there, and they're basically, they feel pretty lost now. Yeah, what do we do now? What do we do now? Because the I mean, last great hope, the last great hope of the world is not going to win the presidency. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, again, you know, we, we've talked about this before, that whole aspect of people looking around and saying, what we need is just we need a good leader. If we could just get a good person in office to, to lead the way, that's that's part of the problem. Yeah, that's because it goes back to what we talked about a few weeks ago because of our um, our fealty to the presidency, the excellency that we feel of the presidency, which is I garbage. Really, I respect right, the not, office. We're not I bringing it down to... We're not worrying about the fact that our liberties come from ourselves and they're inherent in ourselves, and we're trying to pass them off as if we just get this person and everything will be fine, and we don't do anything on an individual level for our own liberties. What I'm really trying to get at is, where does a person go from here? I mean, you seeing all this rhetoric come out of the right, saying, you know... Now that you're Republicans, you might as well go the rest of the mm-hmm. way and vote for Mitt Romney and just be part of the party. The libertarians are saying, run third party now, run. Which, of course, would right, do so nothing more than guarantee the election of Barack Obama. And this is, the, again, that we get down to this, this argument of it's all about power. It's not about principle. Keep, people keep saying you can't support Ron Paul because that's just going to lead to the election of Barack Obama. We can't have another pres- another term of Obama. Look what it's doing to our country. And, right. and, I, and I look back and I say, you know what? Honestly, what has Barack Obama done that is any different than what George H.W. Bush did? Uh, he put a D in front of his name instead of an R. What has he? I mean, seriously, have taxes? Uh, the, 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 the issue with the taxes, is that, is that worse now? Yes. But but is it worse because of him? No. Of course, because of Congress. Okay. What about the military situation? Surely, same thing. Ha- having Obama coming into office, we all thought, oh, okay, now our troops are going to come home from overseas. Haven't we started three new wars? Same thing. All right. Hey, every they, they just, by the way, a few minutes ago voted to uh, go ahead and send troops into Syria. While we're on that note, but did they really? A few minutes ago, I just heard it on the news. Oh. In lovely boots. I believe bombing. No, I believe to send boots. <sighs> wow. I'll, I'll need to check that. I guess. Anyway, so like every other email I get right now, which always happens every four years, every other email I get is basically an anti-Democrat email. I don't think Democrats send emails. Oh, I get I get the Democrat emails because I'm officially unaffiliated, not a Republican, not a Democrat. I get emails from both sides. Oh, I see. And and well, I do. I, I go both ways when it comes to uh, political campaigns that they they i've got both sides wooing me well every single email i get is basically shows the inherent flaws of the democratic party and i'd like to get one email showing the merit of the republican party <laughs> <laughs> that's funny that you said that steve because since i signed up on the party i've been getting all these emails from republicans in anchorage that want money to be they're running for office or whatever support me blah 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 like yeah all right, they I don't do. know me very well if they're asking me to all pay their, them money to run for office. All the rhetoric is anti-democratic and not pro-republican. That's why I think it's funny because where is their merit? Point. I mean, their merit has always been fiscal conservatism, but we saw for eight years that that's a joke. They don't even try and push. Right. That I mean, what did what did what did Bush and his Republican Congress both? He had both houses, right? So we had a Republican president, Republican House, Republican they, Senate. They got rid of abortion. No. Right, oh wait, no, they didn't. Oh no, they what? Didn't. No, what they outlawed they outlawed gay marriage. What? Well, they they were the the supporters and defenders of the Constitution, right? Our, our guns are safer than they ever were. They That's were what the Constitution. Fi- they were fiscally conservative. Fiscally, we absolutely. We have absolutely no. Not only did they balance the budget, they gave us a a a no. They also um, they have the worst they deficit also ever. They repealed the um, the <clears throat> firearms act and the Patriot Act. Made um. 
disbanded the Made TSA. Made fully automatics oh, legal again. Wait, they didn't disband the TSA. They created the TSA, didn't they? Didn't the Republicans give us the Patriot Act? <laughs> Di- oh, didn't they? Quite possibly. All hail the great Republican Party. Bunch they of- had the House, and they had the Senate, and they had the presidency for how long, Josh? Four years? They had all of them for four years. They had all of them for six. For six? Oh. Point of order, by the way, I am. I did a little research Ooh. here, and it is uh, the, information. the United Nations is what voted to send troops. The, the UN uh, Security Council has just voted to send an advanced team of observers well, if that's like anything like Vietnam, anything like Korea, any like anything like any war that we've gotten involved or it's, police action, it's sorry, the camel's it's nose. War. It's, it's the camel's nose under the tent. Any any police action that we've been involved in since the UN came to be, <clears throat> in other words, America is going to go do what now? Mm-hmm. We're going to go and observe and right. protect my, the my people. My point is, is mm-hmm. the UN means Americans are going to go mm-hmm. get killed. But we're going to be wearing American flags under the blue helmet. What? <laughs> we don't even now they wear a flag now that basically says um can't remember what it says, but it's basically it's sum it up, it's international peacekeeper basically. And when I when I went to Bosnia in ninety <clears throat> boy, wow, ninety six, they they sent me there. Did with, you go to Bosnia? I went to Bosnia. I don't believe you. I served there for 12 months, okay? And while I was there, I wore an American flag and all-American uniform. We didn't wear blue helmets. We were there under the auspices of NATO. But what we were doing there, I really struggled with the constitutionality of what we were doing there. I mean, as an average Joe buck sergeant, had my stripes, I had people under my command, and I was under orders myself, and everything that we were doing, I would find myself lying on my cot at night asking myself, is this right? And there were a couple of times that I refused orders from people. And I uh, did, it went up the chain of command, and eventually the people who gave me the orders got in trouble for it um, because I had the moral fortitude to stand up against it. And I want to encourage anybody who happens to be in the military to seriously consider the orders that you're being given. Who are we supporting in Bosnia? Uh, we were actually there to support to to make sure that the Christians did not kill the Muslims, specifically. I thought we were there to make sure the Muslims killed the Christians. No, well, no. You see, uh, uh, that may have been that may have been a side effect because we had you know, part of my job as an intelligence collector is that we had actual positions. We knew where the camps were for Hezbollah, actually, uh, honest to God, terrorists. We knew where the camps were for some of the other local groups, some of the international people that had come in, the Muslim fighters that had come in to fight against the Serbs and against the Croats. But we knew where they were, and we knew what they were what they were training to do, and they were not on our list of objectives. So I, I turned in these reports, and they're like, nope, sorry. So we were there to basically pound on the Serbians, right? That, no, well... To control the to Serbian To make people. sure that they did not kill the Muslims. To make sure that... Make sure that make an sure equal portion, yeah. Make sure an equal terrorists. portion of people killed each other instead of. <laughs> well, so right. So in World War II, who who saved our down pilots that were shot down over that area? Who 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 actually would capture? Well, not capture, but help our pilots get back to England. I, honestly, I don't know. The Serbians. Was it the Serbs? Because yeah. I know the Croats that were in charge there were Ustasha. Nazis. The Ustasha they were the, the yeah. Nazis. Yeah, and the Serbians actually were <laughs> our friends at the time, allies, who, who, for what reason, who knows why mm-hmm. they would give a crud. I guess they're little, small people, and we were going to bomb the crap out of them 50 years later. <laughs> but, yeah, they were a large part of that. During World War II, the uh, Bosnian what? underground, or, whatever, or the Serbians, were a huge factor in helping uh, downed English and American pilots get back to England. Well, at least we paid them back. Yeah, in full, with steel. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thought the Nazis by, sucked. By and, large, Wait till Muslim, you see by and large, Muslims supported the Nazi cause. Almost all of the Arab nations were uh, allies with the Nazis. A little uh, side note here, and this might be an action point for somebody to look up. I don't have it in front of me, so I'm not sure if I got the title right, but I, I read a book about uh, six months ago about the link between the Nazis and the Islamist extremists that basically everybody that we see now in the Arab world as part of this Islamist extremist movement they were part of that same movement that ushered in the Nazis and that they were linked together inextricably 
they, they were they were Hitler's allies then, and they are still advancing their same agenda today, which is kill the Jews. Hmm. Yeah. Not that again. You know, you, you look at the, the I, I, we need to send troops. Dang it. Send our Americans over there to bleed and die. We got, yeah. I got to go back to something really funny here about the... Ten seconds, by the way. Oh. Want to hold to the other side? Yeah, because right. it's funny. I'm going to laugh longer than ten seconds. We got the Fox News right now here on uh, Local Talk Radio. This is 660 on your AM dial. You've got it on the Saturday morning wake-up call. All right, welcome back to the Saturday morning wake-up call right here on KFAR. We are streaming live at KFAR660.com. We also have a chat room available there where this morning... Sleeper AK asks, where's the coffee, Steve? Well, it's in my belly. Yeah. I was a little disappointed this cheap station didn't have any cups, so I had to get one of the big old mugs. I'm all wired up now. I don't drink coffee. (laughs) (laughs) And I just did. All right, right before the break, Josh, you were going to uh, read a quote from someone. Yeah, it's a guy trying to get voted in for state office, state senate. It's really funny at the top of his uh, little ad. I'm not going to pick on the guy's name here. Well, maybe. Uh It says, if you can't change legislation, then change the legislators. That's just... Well, that's 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 hilarious to me. That's been the approach, though, for, I mean, both major parties. It's part of what has kept any other parties out of the process for so many years is that it's it's all about power it's all about power it's Legislation, not about which is which proves what aaron and i and you and david since the day we came in here proves that legislation or um political law is a joke because you get one legislator in there, he makes this law. You get another legislator in there, he repeals it and makes his law. You get another legislator in there, he repeals it and makes this law. And if we, you don't have enough people to change those laws the way you want, you just need to stack the deck. You need to get more in there. How about instead of if you can't change legislation, I would rather see if you can't stop legislation, then stop the legislators, which goes back to paying them, what do we figure, five million bucks if they just go home? Every year. Save a lot of money. Save a lot of money. 100,000 new laws in the United States every year. I read a deal the other day that 250,000, I don't remember what the time frame was, 250,000 state laws what's in all the state municipalities that were passed within this couple year process. And with each law came 10, an average of 10 regulations that added on to those. Well, obviously, uh, we we need regulation, Josh, because we would be completely out of control. Well, of course. And yeah. what's funny is that who is the regulator? The people that. So you have your. What was that number again? Two hundred fifty thousand, ten for each. So if you have uh, you have your voted in legislators, they pass two hundred fifty thousand laws, and then unelected bureaucrats tack on another ten per, mm-hmm. which is how many? Two million five hundred thousand regulations. And people wonder why why we have a problem with all these these books full of regulations. They, Ignorance can, is no excuse. You cannot walk out the door without breaking some regulation. I'm about ready to break a regulation right now. And don't, no, what? I can't I can't handle that. Don't break anything in here. What are they doing you, over at the borough building? Uh, right this second, they've got no. They've got the budget meetings going on oh. today. Which, incidentally, kind of another little side note, in case you missed the newspaper article about it this week. On Thursday night, the borough put on, or the mayor put on the consent agenda. Let's just go ahead and advance 45 million dollars for the school district. Now, being on the consent agenda, that means that they don't talk about it. Nice. They don't even vote on it. You have to take it off the consent agenda in order to even have a discussion. Otherwise, it just advances automatically. Now, the state law... The mayor did that? The mayor did that. How Nat- is he... Natalie Howard pulled it off the consent agenda. They talked about it, and then the rest of the assembly went ahead and voted to go ahead and do that anyway. It's for the children. It is for the children, of course. <laughs> They'd all die. Now, the state... They would all end up dropping out. The state minimum required... We have the highest dropout rate in the nation. We need to throw more money at it. That's the problem. We don't, and I'm obviously money fixes right all of the problems. The, the, the 
the point is this, is that the state I'm minimum for our our borough, for our area, would be about $29 million. That would be the, sta- the starting point. But instead of doing the state minimum, they voted to go ahead and give them $45 million right out of the box, which means you cannot even discuss that. If you wanted to show up over there to the budget meetings today, you, well, can't, you can't even bring up the school district money. You want children to die? Obviously, I must. I must, or you know, replace all of the children out there in the borough with my own. Man, that's kind of cool. So they're sitting over there going over the budget right now. So basically, you've got a bunch of thugs over there deciding how to steal from us right now. You know, it's interesting that you should bring that up because if it, it, taxes aren't stealing, they try to make it seem like it's our patriotic duty to pay our taxes. Yeah. You you need to do your duty and pay your taxes. Isn't that funny? We're like, I, I read this deal on uh, Jeff Berwick's The Dollar Vigilante. Yeah. It was the crab effect or whatever. And uh, he was saying it was an old joke in Canada where they had these two big pot, two big uh, tubs with crabs and you could see them. One had a lid and one didn't. And he said, the a person asked the shop owner, he said, why does this tub have a lid and the other one doesn't? He said, and he said, this was a long time ago when America still was somewhat something worth Oh. In. He said, well, the open one is the crabs from America. Because, no, the open one is the crabs from Canada. Well, no, I'm going to go back to the American ones. The open one, <laughs> the closed one is the the crabs from America. Well, why is that? Because they know they're in bondage, and if you open it, they'll escape. He said, okay, well, what's the open one? He said, those are from Canada. Anytime one of them tries to escape, the other ones reach up and grab them and pull them back down. Now that's America now because yeah. anytime you say, well, you talk about taxes being stealing, what do you get? You get people say, well, it's your patriotic American duty to pay your taxes. And why mm-hmm. is it patriotic and American to pay taxes? If you read history, it was patriotic and American to not pay exactly. taxes. Exactly. The Boston Tea Party, hello. You know, if you think about it, if, if you were out on the street and some thug walked up to you and said, give me your money. You would not have a duty to give him that money. In fact, some might argue you would have a duty to resist giving him that money. But not if he was in a monkey suit. No, well, that's another issue. <laughs> because now if a group of thugs approached you on the street, you might be much more inclined to go ahead and give them whatever they're asking for because you really would prefer to walk away from the experience alive. Correct. But right? is, is, it, is it right for them? It is no more right. When there's a bunch of them? It, 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 even if a whole bunch of people got together and voted and came up to me and said, we decided that we wanted to take your money. Well, what if 10 of them came up in the, to you in the street and said that they wanted your money to feed a guy that they knew that was hungry? That doesn't make it any more morally right for them to say, I'm going to use the money to feed myself. I'm going to use the money that I'm going to take from you to feed somebody else. Or I'm going to use the money that I take from you to go out and buy drugs. It doesn't matter. It is no more morally right for somebody to come up and take money from you if they are a thug on the street or if they are a bunch of elected thugs over there across the river what about that are deciding the, right this second how to spend the money that they're stealing from you. What about if it's to fight drugs? Then it's okay. And fight poverty. I like that. I'm stealing money from you to fight poverty. Of course, you have less now. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great way to get rid of poverty. Just bring everybody to the same level of poverty. That way. Yeah, you bring everyone down. That way there's no... There's no rich people. Are. If you don't see any rich people, then you don't know that you're poor. Wow. All right. Would you like to take a phone call? Yeah. Who? 458 Talk is the number. Let's go to the lines. Good line. morning. Welcome Hola. to the wake up call. Who's this? Uh, Miyama David. Nice. Hey. hey. Oh, okay. How's it going, man? Tu estás en México? Uh, indeed. All right. Well, uh, David, thanks for calling in this morning. All right. On the yeah, phone we right now. just got to bed at 7 30, so uh, still feel <laughs> a little bit rough. <laughs> nice. So I, I would assume it wasn't because things are so horrible there that you had to stay awake to protect your life. It was, uh, yeah, we, well, we had to protect our lives from um, some really fun people and a bottle of tequila. So, <laughs> you know, I, you, you, yeah, Dave, for anybody that, that doesn't realize, this is uh, Dave Giesel on the phone here who has uh, taken his own advice and has gotten out of the country. Now, are you? Uh, yeah. Not Temporarily yet. for now. Okay, I see. So basically, but, um, yeah, it's way nice down here. Um, I mean, you know, you have all it's reliable electricity, good roads, uh, high-speed internet, uh, and then you have you know really generous people and 
Um, that's been expensive. It's really it's really nice down here. Really? The weather's perfect. Any so. Gestapo walking around checking your paper? There are, yeah. Fun story with that. Actually, a couple. Uh, the result of the drug war, there's there's federal police cruising around. They drive up and down the main street maybe every 20 or 30 minutes, all piled in the back of the little Humvee with some guns. Uh, but they never do anything. So we what? Uh, aren't they we fighting actually, drugs? Dave? They had a check. No, they had a checkpoint set up, and uh, we were hanging hanging out with. Uh, some friends of ours, uh, Jeff Berwick, and uh, we, we come up to this checkpoint, and he tells the driver, he's like, don't stop, don't stop, don't stop. And so we rolled right through it. So and wait, you know what happened? Nothing. Did they kill you all? Nothing. Nothing happened. They kind of laughed and waved. Hmm. Wow. Now, is this, now, when you say you've got checkpoints down there, is it kind of like the checkpoints that they have at our airports here, where everybody has to be no. stripped from? Molested? Nope. No, there's none. Yeah, there's none of that. It's just for show. Um, basically, uh, Jeff was telling us any of the uh, drug war stuff that was going on um, over the hill. Yeah. Um, it stopped probably nine months ago, and so his guess is that somebody won. <laughs> right. And, and but they're still the, getting the, mass the, amounts of money to keep up the facade. Uh, well, the, because there's no political will to continue. Um, you know, going out and, and killing the, you know, the heads of these uh, drug cartels or whatever. Now that some guy won, it's just back to business as usual, which is selling people what they want at a price they want. But it's immoral, isn't it, Dave? These drugs, these are these are terrible things, and no, we ought yeah, to stop yeah. other people from putting them into their bodies. I mean, so yeah, you come down, down here and you, you look at all the people enjoying their lives, and you see how they're doing things. You definitely definitely see the uh, the terrible effects of people enjoying themselves. <laughs> the oppression's just overwhelming, it sounds like. It's insane. Yeah, the street shops, you know, with the availability of drugs, the street shops don't even have uh, metal grates that they pull down in front of them when they close because people are so degenerate here that they're passed out on cocaine at home all day, so they're not even <laughs> able to rob the shop. I thought cocaine wired you up. What? <laughs> yeah. Huh. Well, one of, one of the arguments you hear all the time, Dave, about why we should be fighting drugs is because of the horrible things that drugs will do to people. And by even allowing them to be legal, that what we are doing is we, by, by advocating for legalizing drugs, we would possibly be advocating for the degeneration of the children. You know, uh, we were actually out at a club last night till 4 when they closed, and then there was some after hours. Stuff we hung out with some guys. And there were kids out with their parents, so like three or four there. Um, you can get alcohol in Walmart. I mean, nobody checks anybody's ID. And uh, the guys we were hanging out with, they were like 20 to 22. They had basically had the same experience as I had when I was 20 to 22. They weren't like, oh, you know, we, we can get drugs here. So when we were 12, you know, we became heroin addicts for a while just for fun. Didn't happen. They hadn't even used any hard drugs, even though they were, like, highly available. Well, why not? So, don't, don't the drugs go out and yeah, just I jump know, into I, your veins if they're out there on the street? <laughs> yeah, they're just floating around begging you to put them in you. Uh, no, because they're rational people, and they're like, you know, we're not interested in this, so we're not going to do it. People can't be rational, Dave. <laughs> right, they need to be told what to do. They have to the be regulated to be rational. This, uh, that was another, another interesting thing. We were explaining our politics to them. And uh, so we were like, well, okay, I mean, we're basically anarchists. And uh, this one guy translated the word. He's like, oh, oh, freedom, freedom. And we're like, yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> it was pretty cool. That's awesome. It's a different translation than you get in the States. Well, <laughs> here, if you say the word anarchist, you're automatically a violent rabble rouser. Chaos. Well, yeah, chaos, chaos is what most people would say in the States. And here, here these guys are, oh, freedom. Yeah, yeah, we know. Yeah. So are you an anarchist if you don't believe that we should have 2,500,000 new regulations a year? <laughs> I suppose so. Are you an anarchist if you don't believe that we should be sending American troops to put poots on the ground in every country around the world? <laughs> uh, quite possibly. This is like the, uh, you might be a redneck if. <laughs> yeah. You, you're sounding pretty violent to me, Dave. Yeah. I'm, yeah I don't right, want 2,500,000 regulations a day. <laughs> Okay, a year, whatever. 
Sounds like they need more legislators down there. And you don't want to kill people. It sounds to me like the quota of bricks is not high enough. We need to we need to raise the quota of bricks and make you gather your own straw. And yes. <laughs> what is that? Right. If you've is uh, I'm I'm thinking I know the answer here, but what is the political error there? Does anyone give a care? Yeah. Well, um, it's I mean, unfortunately, a lot of people care. Uh, and there's a lot of voting that goes on, but it's interesting. There's right now in Acapulco, there appears to be a struggle between the uh, local small bus company and some sort of municipal run bus. And so the buses that go by every two minutes and actually get you where you want to go have these signs on them that say, uh, you know, no governor, we're going to keep running our own buses. It doesn't matter what you tell us. And the buses that come by every, you know, 30 minutes to an hour that you'd have to wait for and have crappy service. Uh, the city buses uh, don't have those signs on them. Um, so yeah, so people are uh, are you know pushing back in that way. I guess there was a big protest down here a few months ago, like 10,000 people in the streets calling for an end to the drug war because of all the violence it brought. So I yeah, thought the actually, drug um, I thought the drugs actually, brought the violence. I actually heard about that on the news. Yeah. So apparently, uh, and uh, what Calderon is there their president now, his, his goose is cooked. There's no way he's going to be reelected because people are sick of the drug war violence. Did they mace everyone that protested? No. It, it turns out they didn't. Yeah. You know, Dave, I, uh, I know yeah. that you you probably do you keep your finger on the pulse of what's happening here in Fairbanks when you're down there in sunny Acapulco, and you're probably <laughs> completely <laughs> aware, <laughs> aware of everything. This week I had Matt Want on the program as we talked about borough business, and he asked me, uh, if I honestly believed that if we got rid of the borough, that all these vital borough services would be provided by the private sector if we didn't have the government doing it. And I said, absolutely, I believe that, Matt. I yes. believe that either the the private sector would provide it or those services would go to go away because people wouldn't want them. I said, if uh, people haven't, really haven't wanted somebody there. to come and pick up their trash, they would hire somebody to come pick up their trash for them. Yeah, I haven't come down to Acapulco here for a week. He'll, he'll see how it's done. <laughs> uh, Dave, no was, needed. back to nobody getting maced, I think what the problem is is they probably don't know where to get maced. So if you just hook them up with my website. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, FNP. Uh, well, I mean, the food's really spicy, so the mace probably wouldn't even work. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. They're used to habaneros. The cayenne pepper wouldn't do nothing. That's <laughs> right. Totally immune. <laughs> I thought only in America we had the right to protest. No, yeah, we, you need we, a right to protest. We, yeah. No, you we need a the, permit to protest here. I mean, think right. about it. When is the last time you heard of somebody who went out and had a protest in the streets without a permit? Well, the Occupy guys, you, and they were... At, uh, uh, exactly. You look right here at our own Occupy uh, mm. Fairbanks guys. I don't know. You have everybody calling for them needing to be permitted. Well, uh, well, and you know what? Yeah. The mayor has bowed to that pressure, by the way. The mayor j this week just issued a citation to the Occupy Fairbanks people because they have now passed new regulations on the use of parks. So to, in order, in, I know, because <laughs> because these people down there were exploiting the gaping hole that was obviously putting all of the public at risk by them being out there in tents on public land. Now they have passed new regulations, and they are going out and citing these people so that, you know what, they might just damage the grass underneath those tents. So next they're going to mace them. I want to think about Mexico some more. Do you think uh, <laughs> is uh, the right to protest in their uh, constitution or something? No, I think it's in their psyche. I don't know what's in their constitution. I, they, they don't seem really that concerned about it. They how can you do something if it, about... How can you do something if it's not protected by the, the constitution? If the government, if, if the <laughs> yeah. government doesn't outline what your rights are, then why how would you even have anarchy? Wow, what? there'd be freedom in the streets. I'm going to be saying some special prayers for you tonight. <laughs> yeah. Standing on the on the 25th floor right now, overlooking the bay, sun's out. There's waves crashing below, and it's like 80 degrees. So <laughs> I'm gonna buy a bigger much gun that can reach down you. here. <laughs> That's too hot. That's man. if you like things like that. We've mm -hmm. got a mild drizzle with snow <laughs> melting, and the uh, river still frozen with the beautiful scenery of the borough building. Where they are <laughs> right <laughs> now, determining how to spend the money that they're going to steal from us this year. <laughs> The budget, meet, the budget meetings are going on right now, and I oh, just I feel the warmth. Didn't you just feel have, the warmth? Have you figured out anything as far as uh, have you talked taxes with Jeff? What's a tax yeah, structure? Yeah, um, like essentially there? nobody pays. So your <laughs> business can grow to a certain extent before anybody even notices. And when they do notice, you just pay off the guy who comes, and that works for as long as you want it to. 
And then if it doesn't work, you just close your business and start a business under a new name. And then if they come back to you, you renegotiate. They say, you owe us, you know, $300, $400 in taxes. Like, look, I'll pay you 200 if you're nice. And then they go, oh, well, okay, okay. Yeah. So but it almost sounds, so this, it this almost sounds like they're here. honest about their thuggery down there. Oh, uh, well, yeah, I mean, you know. It, it seems like it. Seems when when, like it, when they come by to treat. extort you for the privilege of operating a business, you just pay off the individual who comes to extort you instead of having to go through the process of paying your taxes so that they can pay the person who comes out to extort the business. Right, and and you may not even have to. I mean, depending on how you run your thing. Um, I mean, most businesses down here on the street are not licensed. They have no permit. They don't have a sticker from, you know, some food agency that says their food won't kill you. Well, um, aren't all the people but, dead because of all the food that they're eating? Yeah, yeah, no, we, Josh and I were talking about that last night. It's like, why aren't there bodies in the street? This food is delicious, but certainly killing us because there aren't stickers on the business. Wow. Well, yeah, there, driving with a license, meh. You know, license plates themselves, eh. I think I we mean, need to adopt some them, of that. I think we need to adopt some of that thuggery here in America. I think that law enforcement needs to just have a credit card machine in the car. That way you could just <laughs> oh, no, you're your giving them ideas. You know they're listening, Aaron. Now they're going to, next time you get pulled over, they're going to be like, hey, thanks for the idea. We actually have a, <laughs> be like a last airline. Well, I mean, if, you, if you're living under regulatory law, you're guilty before anything even happens. I mean, as the officer walks up to the car, whatever he pulled you over for could even go out the window well, and cite you for 500 and different the, other things. What's the first question they always ask you? Do you, you know, know why I, I pulled you over? over? That yeah. gives you an opportunity to incriminate yourself. Yeah. Well, it could be hang for on, the 700 on, parking yeah. tickets I didn't pay. <laughs> uh, is, is it because yeah. I was speeding, officer? Oh, I yeah. know. I just ran over somebody in the crosswalk. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty sick. Oh, man. So you got basically crazy people running around with machetes opening stores up and businesses with no licenses. I mean, that's horrible in yeah. itself. Eating unregulated food. No FDA deciding what's good for you, what's bad for you. It, it might, They might have one, but nobody pays attention to it. Yeah. Yeah. Are you telling me that they also drive vehicles down there that will actually run without being yeah. licensed and, and uh, registered? You know, most of them appear to have that stuff on them, but some of them just don't. Well, up, up here, I mean, seem... you've been told all the time you can't drive without a registration. Yeah, no, the, the vehicles down here seem pretty immune to having stickers on them. What? They seem to run whether they have stickers on them or not. <laughs> so that's a little bit different than in America. Yeah. I know so I've, know, told, you, I've been told that without the right stickers, cars just don't work right in America. Well, it's not It's not about them running, because if you have a parked vehicle, it has to be registered too, isn't it? Oh, man. <laughs> I, don't uh, know, I don't think that's, that's the case good. in Fairbanks. I don't know if that's the case in Fairbanks, but it's most of the lower 48, and it's definitely Anchorage. You can't yeah. just have yeah. a vehicle. No, it's here, too. It is here, too? Yep. So yeah. if you have a vehicle just parked, it has to be registered. Registered with the state, yeah. You don't have to pay for the, the local the local stamp, but the state wants their pound of flesh for your privilege of having of that even vehicle. having a vehicle, even if you were never, ever going to drive it. Right. Well, because your property... So, I mean, just, I'm just... The only point I'm trying to make is it has nothing to do with driving it. And yeah. We're joking it's about your that. right to own... It's your right to own a vehicle. Yeah. So it's not your right to own a vehicle. Really? So the cash economy, by the way, down here is massive. I really? mean, almost everything is cash. And that's part of the way that these businesses operate. But how do um, they track How do they track the receipts? You know, they're just using yeah. cash. Yeah, it turns out I'm uh, not really a problem. People don't complain about that. I'm just you, you must get not be off, in the right you do this place. weird thing. You don't go back. Really? It's really weird. Yeah, nobody sues anybody or you just don't go back. It's pretty strange. Man, it sounds oppressive. I know. <laughs> just the, being able to make up your own mind instead of having somebody get, tell you what to do about it, that just sounds too scary. And how are you going to make any money if you're not suing anybody? What's that? So how are you going to make money if you're not suing anybody? Everybody in California would be broke. Right. I, yeah, it's a different way of uh, doing things. You actually have to offer a service that somebody wants. Kind of strange. Yeah, this is too weird. Surely you're just being taken to the right parts of the Probably the water city. is probably getting to me. Yeah. Surely there's mass graves somewhere. <laughs> there's got to be Gestapo I, beating down the doors. It's got to be somewhere. It's funny, oh, interestingly yeah. enough, the only time I've ever personally seen mass graves is when a government has been involved in the systematic extermination of people who would not do what they said. Hmm. Yeah, they really just don't have 
pretty sensitive to do that here. So not a, not a great concern. So bottom line, people, people their, their biggest concern is about the, uh, the monster to the north coming south. So <laughs> well, we're on our way. Wow. Yeah. So basically but, people are just living their lives, enjoying it. Pretty much. Yeah. The level of enjoyment, uh, you know, per hour in the day here is, I don't know, four or five, six times higher than I've seen anywhere in the state. But don't they feel it? Don't they feel a duty to the state? Uh, no, haven't really seen that. Haven't really seen that. And what about so so they don't have any patriotic duty down there? What's wrong with those people? I mean, you know, they they like uh, Mexico for real reasons, not because you know it's just a a thing that they were told to like. They, they, they like Mexico because they were things that are there to like it, not because they've been told to like it. I like that. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. That's pretty sweet. You know, uh, I got Josh Luther here. He can finish off the segment for you. If cool. You want. Yeah. Cool. I'll, uh, I'll pass you along here. Thanks, Thanks for thanks, calling Dave. in, man. Appreciate it. Be, yeah, be safe. I'll see you guys uh, when I get back there. All right. right on. Take your time. No rush. Although you are missed up here. <laughs> Hi, Good. guys. How's it going? Good morning, Josh. It's, it's good. Sweet. It's like 90 degrees, sun shining. No, not here. The borough building closed <laughs> down. They decided not to pass a budget this year. They they disbanded the borough. The taxes. Yeah, it's great. Mm. How's it there? <laughs> it's fantastic. I heard Dave talk about a lot of stuff that I've noticed, but we're seeing we're seeing things everywhere we go that are stark, like the no stickers thing. The bus thing is huge. Basically, these buses that are competing with the municipal buses. Um. They're all pimped out, and they're covered in, like, shiny glittery paint, and they've got spinners for hubcaps or for, for rims or whatever. they got, like, American cartoon characters all over them. And honestly, they come by to pick you up every probably 10 seconds. Like, realistically, it's, like, 10 seconds. And the city bus is, like, half an hour wait. It's just it's so stark. You're, you're sitting there eating lunch at some unregistered restaurant for $2 on the side of the street, and you see, like, 100 buses that are from this little company come by, and then you see the one city bus that, like, lumber miles slow. It's, Stuff like that everywhere we go, nonstop. So it's it's a great experience. Yeah, but Definitely the city bus is probably free. <laughs> no, it's probably not. <laughs> <laughs> no, free, but, quote unquote. But think about, I mean, if you don't go to the city bus, then then what about the poor city worker? No, I mean, yeah, exactly. You, you need, you need to, it, It's his right to have that job, isn't it? Right, and then you won't be able to negotiate his raise if uh, the ridership is so low. So I mean, you're really doing a disservice to him. But, you know. My goodness. Wow. How can you live with yourself without supporting the local government to the place where you live? <laughs> yeah. Monster. You guys planning on doing any, you don't have to talk about it if you don't want, any more travels? Or is this uh, in Mexico or last um, stop? Or, we're not sure. We're kind of playing it by ear, which is a great thing. This, this place really supports playing it by ear. So, cool. We'll see. Well, That's hot. nice. <laughs> All right, thanks for, very much for participating with us this morning. We're coming up on the Fox News yeah, Josh, right here at the Tell top me. of the hey, hour. Be and safe. then we're going to transition into the second hour of the program, which we call Patriots Lament, right here on KFAR. It's Local Talk Radio online at KFAR660.com. Hey, hey, this song is for us. Welcome to uh, Patriots Lament right here on KFAR. We are Local Talk Radio 660 on your AM dial in Fairbanks and also online at KFAR660.com around the world. Now, before we get going this hour here in our full glory, I do want to invite you all to meet the panel this morning from Bighorn Enterprises when performance matters. Please welcome Josh Bennett. Good morning, Josh. Good morning, Steve. (laughs) All right. And the, is that your crowd of applause in the background? All right. And from the Fairbanks Campaign for Liberty, we've got Sam Van der Good morning. Good morning, Sam. And uh, from Far North Tactical downtown at the corner of 8th and Lacey, we have Aaron Bennett. Ooh. Good morning, Steve. Ooh. All right. Now, yes. do, do you still have people coming in there asking to buy things like body armor and firearms? And I'm about to buy another firearm and shoot somebody. <laughs> Your brother? That's Probably. not very nice. All right. Uh, well, you know what? Welcome to the show, everybody. Uh, joining us on the phone right now, we had a caller who uh, actually called in at the end of the last hour. Are you there? Good morning. What's your name? Randy. Randy. Go ahead, Randy. What's oh, on your mind Randy. today? Yeah, yeah. I just uh, am again reporting on what the uh, Borough Assembly did on Thursday night on April the 12th in passing a resolution 
saying that there needs to be a amendment to the United States Constitution which would reverse the Citizens United Supreme Court decision, which happened back in 2010, where they, the Supreme Court said because of the First Amendment, anybody, anytime, you know, a corporation, whoever, whatever, uh, has a right to use their money to put forth an ad or express an opinion, you know, and uh, it, it having to do with politics or a political issue. And uh, a lot of people did not like that. They said, oh, the corporations are too big and powerful or whatever. And uh, uh, they passed that resolution in the borough assembly uh, by a narrow vote, five to four. Uh, some of the conservative ones voted against it. Michael Dukes, Natalie Wood, Matt Want, and Diane Hutchinson. So it's five four decision. Natalie Wood? No, on Natalie Howard. He meant Natalie uh, Howard. Sorry, Don't I'm give sorry. him a hard time. I, you know, Randy, let me just ask uh-huh. you here on a as a as a matter of concern here in terms of uh, before we all get worked up about the idea of oh no, the borough has passed a resolution urging the changing of the U.S. Constitution. What exactly does a resolution passed by the borough do? Does it does it have any kind of binding power on anybody else? No, it doesn't. It just simply adds to the national effort. Uh, there's a big, powerful national effort, you know, common causes behind it, to try to get this amendment to the U.S. Constitution passed. And if you go to these websites, you'll see all these different little towns and boroughs, towns and places throughout the country that have passed a similar resolution, and, and uh, Fairbanks has joined in with them, and also uh, the resolution that was, uh, 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 anyway, anyway, the guy that passed it, um, oh, I forgot his name suddenly, but uh, um, uh, it doesn't mention the actual wording of the amendment, because I guess you could come up with certain words, but there has been an amendment proposed in the United States Congress, in the Senate, a certain bill, uh, <clears throat> that bill being... Uh, uh, Senate Joint Resolution Number 29, and it's got 22 co-sponsors, and Senator Mark Baggage is one of them. And uh, I think it's very important to know what this uh, amendment says. And and so if I could just uh, tell you what Section One says. All right, go quick. You got about a minute. Okay. There's two sections, but I'm just going to tell you what Section One. And in Section One, there's two lines, number one and number two, and it's the two that's really bad, in my opinion, my humble opinion. Anyway, here's what it says: the proposed amendment to the United States Constitution, Section One: Congress shall have power to regulate the raising and spending of money and in-kind equivalents with respect to federal elections, including through setting limits on, one, the amount of contributions to candidates for nomination for election two or for elections to federal office, and two, the amount of expenditures that may be made by, in support of, or in opposition to such candidates. In other words, there are taken over our right to have free speech. In other words, this amendment, unlike other amendments which limit the government, this amendment gives power to the government and limits the people, and Mark Begich is for this. No doubt about it. And the quickest way to get rid of any worrying about that is if we just all quit voting, then bang. One of those things would have to... We'd have, yeah, because then you know, they can regulate their, their little... I mean, it's just like the whole Republican convention thing, isn't it, Randy? I mean, if you don't, if you're not a Republican, you can't participate. Uh, and so, I mean, what's the difference between letting them regulate, uh, the, letting the Republicans regulate the Republicans or letting the Congress regulate all of the elections? Oh. If, if, if it doesn't concern you, why why be concerned? Why, why get all worked up about it? Yeah, and, and just to slip in, uh, speaking of participation, I suppose everybody knows that Eilson Air Force Base is having an open house today from 10 to 6 p.m. and might be our last chance to go see the F-16s before they pull out of here. And also, open house continues tomorrow at Eilson Air Force Base. All right. Thanks, Randy, for your call. Appreciate it. 458 Talk is the number. Here. And now joining us on the guest line, uh, Sam, why don't you introduce our guest? Yeah, so Seth King runs a website called uh, dailyanarchist.com. Um, and so, you know, on this show, we've been talking a lot about how the government is overreaching its powers um, and how we got to get back to the Constitution. But arguably, Seth takes it takes these ideas to the logical extreme, um, in that he advocates no government whatsoever. So we we thought we'd have him on the show today. Um, last week we were talking about um, people always ask us, well, what can we do, you know? And so we started talking about some some methods to uh, to to push back. And one of those uh, a caller called in and talked about bitcoins. So we were gonna have Seth on to talk about bitcoins because he uses bitcoins, um, as well as agorism, the idea behind agorism. So welcome, Seth. Uh, welcome. Uh, thank you for having me. And uh, did I say Sunday? I hope I hope I said Saturday. 
Oh, that's all right. No worries. I'm here. I apologize. <laughs> Seth, this is Steve. I, I've, I've got a couple of questions for you here right out of the box because I, I'm, I'm hearing Sam talk on the other side of the microphone there, and I'm not understanding the words coming out of his mouth. What are... <laughs> Uh, I mean that that second word you you use there. Right? Was it algorithm? And what was it? <laughs> Ag- agorism. Agorism. And what is that? Well, agorism is basically just the free market. It's it's a market that um, is willing to operate outside of the purview of the state, right? So anytime two or more individuals come together and trade goods and services uh, without you know asking for permission from the government, without paying tithings to the government. Um, it, 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 it's agorism, and it can be anything from as um, uh, e- simple as uh, selling, you know, pencils without permission to uh, selling things that are strictly prohibited, you know, like drugs or whatever. So it's anything that the government doesn't strictly give you permission to do, and you don't pay for in taxes. So basically, like if anybody locally were to be selling raw milk or cheese or anything else off of their goats or cows. Or if somebody were to say want to sell you your eggs, the government would come in and step all over you because that's against the regulations. But if people were doing it anyway, that would be agorism. Yeah, that would be absolutely. Yeah, and there's a lot of people that do that already. I mean, there's a there's an article I read recently that um, in the entire global you know economic uh, the GDP that the uh, the underground market is actually as big as the above ground market. It's huge. Yeah. I'm, I'm uh, getting. It happens all the time. I'm getting personally a little tired of all the chemicals that I've been feeding my family through all of this processed mm-hmm. foods that I purchase with my government issued coupons that they tell me that I need to feed my family with these WIC approved milks and cheeses and everything else. I kind of like the idea of going out and getting some of the stuff direct from the source. So uh, b- before we go any further, I, I identified Seth as an anarchist. But I, I, I want to give him a chance to define that word because a lot of people get emotionally hung, hung up on that word and they have these sort of negative connotations associated with it. You say anarchy, they think chaos, they think children being run over by dump trucks in the streets. Um, so, Seth, you want to define what, what that t- word means to you? Sure. Anarchism, anarchism there's, there's many different flavors of anarchism. And I actually um, am perfectly okay with it as long as it's voluntary. There's anarcho-communism. Uh, I consider myself an anarcho-capitalist. And basically, the, the essence of it is simply that everything that the government currently, quote-unquote, provides for us can be done more efficiently and more qualitatively through uh, free market, through voluntary trade, um, from schools to health care to roads to police protection and even courts. All of that can be done through, uh, through free trade. All right. If it can be done by free trade, why isn't it done by free trade? Why why it does government step in and tell us how to do it? Well, because um, these ideas are fairly new, right? There's always been, you know, for, for thousands of years, there's always been a government, so people just kind of accept that there is one. But I think government probably got created thousands of years ago through basically just the, uh, you know, the, the biggest gang on the block just decided to uh, stay put in one city instead of, you know, you know going from town to town and, Pillaging, they decided to stay put and and pretend to be the protectors of the citizens as long as the citizens would, you know, pay 30% of their produce every year or whatever to the criminal gang. And over time, it just kind of got called government. Um, in order for it to, in order for us to more or less cast off the yoke of government, we're going to have to, you know, really radically change people's perception of what government is. So right now, because People think that the government is this benevolent organization that's there to take care of us and provide for us and do all these things. We're, we're still going to have government. But as more and more individuals, and, and this is happening every single day, more and more individuals are coming to recognize the government as a totally unnecessary evil. As more and more people recognize that, um, they'll start practicing agorism and they'll start disobeying the government, and, and eventually the government will crumble because my opinion is, is that the government is a criminal organization. And what determines the size and scope of any criminal organization, whether it's the Bloods and Crips in L.A. or MS-13 in Maryland or uh, the United States federal government, whatever just, what determines the size and scope of, of a criminal organization is its resources and the amount of resistance it has. So the reason why the Bloods and the Crips don't rule the world is because they don't have very many resources, right? People aren't loaning the money. Uh, they, they don't have the expropriation that the United States federal government does. And there's just too much resistance. But the reason why the United States criminal organization is so big and powerful is because a lot of people believe in it. People are willing to buy treasury bills. 
they're willing to loan money. Uh, they have the ability to, you know, expropriate, you know, one and a half, two trillion dollars a year. Uh, and there's not very much resistance. People are fighting back. But as more people fight back against the government in more ways than one, whether it's through the, you know, Afghan warriors or Iraq soldiers or just people in the United States that are just disobeying and not giving it, the more resistance the United States federal government gets, or any criminal organization for that matter, it will shrink. It's, it's, but it's, Seth, I mean, isn't it our patriotic duty to pay taxes? I mean, we're told from the time that we're children in the public schools that death and taxes are the two inevitable futures for us, that we have absolutely no choice. We will die, and we will pay taxes. We've well, all heard I, that, I, death and taxes, right? Yeah, and I think that's, you know, as much as we revere the uh, the Founding Fathers, I think that's one of their one of their shortcomings, was the simple, simple fact that they... They hadn't even yet envisioned a society that was, you know, voluntarily organized. Uh, and so they, they figured, okay, government might be an evil, but it's a necessary one. And it's taken us over 200 years, but uh, fortunately, thanks to much brighter minds than myself, they've, they, we've been able to figure out ways to uh, organize society without, without coercion, without the threats of violence. So, I mean, these are relatively new ideas, um, but thanks to the Internet, the ideas are just exploding. There are more and more people all over the world, not just Americans, uh, people in Germany, people in India. Uh, I go to my website, and I, and I look at, you know, I, I track where people come from, and I just get views from all over the world, people that are just really loving this idea that, hey, you know what, we actually don't need government, we do a lot better without it. All right, uh, Seth, give me your website, and then I have another quick follow-up question before we go to the phone lines. Oh, uh, my website is Daily Anarchist. That's one word. DailyAnarchist.com. All right. Now the other the other question was you had mentioned bitcoins. What are what are bitcoins? Before we go into bitcoins, so I wanted to ask him more on the lines of what he's talking about right now, Seth. Um, I read something that you wrote. It's actually been a couple of years now. What rights means to me? Mm-hmm. And I thought one of the interesting things that you said in there was that natural law, Austrian economics, and anarchy are operating 100% of the time, all day, every day. Can you uh, expand on that a little bit and actually what your take was on the difference between basically rights and liberty? Okay, the the, the topic on rights and liberty is quite involved, and, and, and I really wouldn't, wouldn't expect anybody to fully appreciate that unless they've already converted to anarchism. So right. I don't really want to touch on that, but as far as... Um, we're already living in an anarchist society. That's absolutely true. A lot of people think that, you know, you don't have anarchism unless the government goes away. But my attitude is that there really is no government. You know, I use the word government for convenience, um, but there is no government. It's just a large criminal organization. And so we are, we always have been, and we always will be living in a complete state of anarchy, which is the same thing as, you know, we're always living under the rules of, you know, like Austrian economics. If you understand Austrian economics, at the end of the day, it's really just human action. It's really just reality. It's about how the world really operates without, you know, blinders on. And so, um, you know, it's like Ayn Rand said, you can ignore reality, but you cannot ignore the consequences of ignoring reality. And, and so reality is going on all the time, whether we want to admit it or not. And anarchy, we are living in a state of anarchy. Now, we like to convince ourselves that oh, there is law and order, and there is, no, there isn't. There is no such thing as law and order. That's just a government fiction that, you know, that we all kind of believe in. But the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, there's killing going on all the time, all over the world. There's, there's theft and murder and rape, and, I mean, everything is going on all the time. So we really are living already in chaos, and we're living in anarchy. And an anarchist is one that's saying, hey, you know, we're ignoring the fact that we're living in anarchy, and because of that, we're, we're, we're suffering from the results, which is chaos. And an anarchist is one somebody who wants to, you know, work towards uh, natural order. So we want more order in the world. We don't like all this chaos, all these wars, and all the bad things that are going on. We don't like that. We want to get rid of that chaos, and we want to get people in line with how the world really operates. Truth about human nature and all these things. Then we'll be much more in line with anarchy, and we won't be suffering from the consequences of ignoring it. And, and arguably, governments are some of the biggest perpetrators of chaos. If you look at all the wars, all the genocides, all the mass murders done by governments. I mean, uh, R.J. Rummel, a professor from Hawaii, I, b- I believe he's from, from Hawaii, um, added up the amount of people killed by governments in the 20th century, and it was 262 million people. I mean, that's chaos right there. Mm. Right, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's more or less, you know, I didn't come to anarchism lightly. I was always a libertarian. Uh, you know, a libertarian. 
uh, um, small government guy. And so I didn't just hop into anarchism. I had to really do a lot of reading and thinking and soul searching. And one of the ways I came to it was I just made a list in my head. I said, okay, what are all of my fears about no government? You know, what are my fears of anarchy? And I said, okay, well, I'm worried about killing and theft and, you know, kidnapping and rape and all these things. And then I realized, I was like, wait a minute, all of the things that I'm worried about are happening all the time, all over the world, en masse, by the hands of government. So, you know, my fears were, I think, a little unjustified. <laughs> but and yet that's exactly what they want you to do, isn't it? Isn't that how the governments keep people away from the idea of right. anarchism is to, right. you know? Is that misdirection? Can we talk about bitcoins now, please? Yeah, please. please. All right. Yes. I, I, I've never heard of what a bitcoin was until they talked about it last week, and even then I didn't get a good definition. Seth, tell me what bitcoins are. Bitcoins is basically just another currency, right? And currencies come about in many different ways. Uh, historically, currencies were basically just the best commodity, right? Whether, you know, maybe back in the day it was rice or wheat, or, and the, over time it turned into gold and silver. Gold and silver for thousands of years were a very good currency. Um, but in the last few centuries, governments have figured out a way to live beyond the, um, the bindings of gold and silver. And they've, they've got their central banks, and they, they can print money up out of thin air. And so money really has been detached from gold and silver for quite a while. And so money now is basically just digits on a machine. You know? And, and, and those, those digits uh, and how much money there is in the world is more or less set by governments or central banks, whatever you want to call it. And they have the ability to print money up out of thin air, or create new money, or destroy money, and you have a central authority over this that, that controls this money. And what, what Bitcoins are is that it's a digital money. Uh, it's not anything that you'd recognize like gold and silver, um, but at the same time, it's not controlled by a central bank or a government. And so what it is is it's, it's basically money that is um, validated and protected by all of its users. And the way it's done this, and the way, it, the way it's done is through uh, strong cryptography. Now, uh, it can get really, you can go really into the details, um, but at the end of the day, it's, just, it's really good math that protects the, the integrity of the currency. And, and the strong cryptography is actually so uh, mathematically strong that it, it cannot be broken, and it won't be broken, they estimate, for another 30 or 40 years. And even when the, the, the strength of the cryptography is broken, we can easily just make our, our cryptography stronger. So at the end of the day, it, Bitcoin is a new currency that is uh, protected through strong cryptography. It cannot be counterfeited. That's the beautiful thing about it, is that governments and central banks really are the biggest counterfeiters in the entire world. And the beautiful thing about Bitcoin is that it cannot be counterfeited. So it's, it's, uh, it's, its supply is strictly limited. And will be for a very, very, you know, forever. All right, all right. Seth. Now I've got three follow-up questions. I'm just going okay. to give you all three of them, and maybe you can create a, a narrative that'll answer all three of these questions. First, who created the bitcoins? I mean, is it something that just evolved on its own, or did somebody sit down and say, "I'm going to create this new currency"? Second, what is it based upon? I mean, is it is there something of value beyond the the digital bits out there that actually could be traded in for something of real value like gold or silver? And third is how do you earn bitcoins if you, i mean right now the way i earn my paycheck is i i i work for the monkeys here i'm one of the monkeys i i get paid in my bananas and you know everything's fine because it's something that we've agreed upon about what i'm going to get paid now what what irritates the snot out of me about that is that the value of what i'm getting paid keeps going down because the prices keep going up and my paycheck doesn't keep going up but the government workers paychecks keep going up Right. Those so. are good questions. Let me start off one by one. Uh, it was invented or it was created by um, some very uh, skilled cryptographers and computer engineers, coders, right? It's basic, Bitcoin is really just software. It's just, it's just computer software, um, but it was mixed with strong cryptography. So whoever invented it, and we don't know, it, he goes by this person or persons went by the uh, pseudonym of Satoshi Nakamoto. But that's irrelevant. The point is, is it's basically just high-tech software. The software is free and open source, which means anybody can read it. You can read the entire source code of the, uh, the software. There's no hidden you know, backdoors or anything like that that you have to worry about. So that's one of the old things. Um, so that's where it came from. Um, what it's backed by is, and this is something that took me a long time to really wrap my head around. For a long time, I always you know, said, hey, you know, money needs to be backed by gold and silver or, or some other commodity. And so it took me a long time to, to want to accept Bitcoin because I said, well, it's not backed by anything. Why should I like it? And 
as my, you know, as I thought about it more and more, I came to the realization that money isn't necessarily about a commodity. It's more about a network. What makes a, a net, what makes a commodity or a currency strong is really how many people are willing to accept it for goods and services, in payment of goods and services. Why is the dollar so much stronger than the peso? Well, everybody around the dollar, everybody around the world accepts the dollar. And even though they're counterfeiting it to the tune of trillions of dollars every year, because so many people accept it, that's why the federal government has so much power. Whereas, you know, the Mexican peso, they can't counterfeit it very much or else people will totally reject it and then they don't have any power at all. Uh, so the currency is really backed by who's willing to accept it for goods and services. Um, and as more and more people, uh, like myself, it took me a while, but I finally got around to it, as more and more people um, are willing to say, yeah, you know what, I'll sell my, my flags for your bitcoins or I'll work for, you know, two bitcoins an hour or whatever it is. As more and more people do that, the stronger the currency gets. And how do you get the currency? <clears throat> Anything in, like in the free market. For example, um, I have contributing uh, authors who submit content for my blog. I pay them in Bitcoin. I tell them ahead of time that for every unique visitor that clicks on uh, one of their articles, they'll earn 0.02 Bitcoin. So, you know, if you get 100 clicks, well, I get a lot more than that. But if they get, a, you know, 100 clicks on their article, that's two Bitcoins there, and I send them two Bitcoins. Um, how do I get Bitcoins? I sell flags for Bitcoins. One flag costs about seven Bitcoins. Um, or, and I also like to buy Bitcoins. I have somebody that I, you know, send some money in the mail every now and then, and he sends me Bitcoin. So it's, it's basically just really, it's, it's a free market currency is what it is. It's the perfect agorist currency. And it's something I like to tell lefties is, hey, it's the people's currency. So really it appeals to a wide spectrum of people. All right. We are coming up on a break right now. Thanks very much for those answers. Uh, Seth, can you hang with us for the rest of the hour? Absolutely. All right. Wonderful. We've got Seth King on the line from the Daily com, and we'll be back with more Patriots Lament. And welcome back to Patriots Lament right here on KFAR. You know, when uh, most people think the word anarchy, they think of uh, the Sex Pistols, or in this case here, Motley Crue. Uh, anarchy in terms of the violent overthrow of government, leaving nothing in its wake except confusion and chaos and uh, here on the phone with us to kind of dispute some of that is uh, Seth King from DailyAnarchist.com. Seth, you still with us? Yep. All right, and in the studio we've got uh, Aaron Bennett from Far North Tactical, Josh Bennett from Bighorn Enterprises, and uh, Sam Brenderhall from the Fairbanks Campaign for Liberty. Now, Sam, you had a couple of follow-up issues on uh, Bitcoin. Yeah, I just wanted to po- uh, point out a thing, a couple things, add a couple things. Um, you can actually buy Bitcoins online through exchanges. There are online exchanges that will trade U.S. dollars, um, euros, and other currencies for bitcoins, um, and so Seth was talking about how he he sends money in the mail to somebody to get bitcoins. That's one way to do it, um, but you can also do exchanges for people who aren't comfortable mailing uh, mailing off their money to a, a unknown person. So so there's a lot of ways to do it. Um, you can sell things for bitcoins. You can work for bitcoins, um, or you can go online and and um, buy them with dollars and other currencies. Um, uh, I want to also point out that I have bought a flag from Seth with bitcoins. So I've, I've, a lot of people come up and, you know, they, they sort of don't understand Bitcoins, and I've, I've been told it's not a real currency because it's just digital and it's not backed by anything, but you can use it to buy real goods and services. And um, I'd like to point out that gold isn't backed by anything. Seth was talking about this, how um, currency only gets its value from people trading and exchanging with it, and that's absolutely true because gold isn't backed by anything. You know, it doesn't have any intrinsic value. If people don't value it, then it has no value. Well, and, and if you look and you compare the, the U.S. dollar right now, part of the reason why the U.S. dollar is falling in value right now is because fewer and fewer people trust it as a currency. Because because it's being inflated. And so you're losing value when you hold it in the bank. And people don't trust the central bank anymore because the central bank's printing a bunch of currency and it's devaluing all of our dollars. But that can't happen with Bitcoins. There is uh, inflation in Bitcoins, but it's... It's a, it's known, and it's, so it's a built-in, steady inflation rate that people know. Um, th- th- there's no central bank that will randomly print print extra coins to bail out big corporations or anything. All right, uh, Seth, you ready to take some phone calls? Sure. All right, four five eight talk is the number. As we go to the phones, good morning, caller. Who's this? Lawrence, Steve. Coming is Mark. Mark, what's on your mind? Well, Seth, uh, like a spelling on your egorism, whichever kind of ism that is, and how does it differ from laissez-faire capitalism? Uh, it's not. I mean, I, I wouldn't consider it any different, to be honest. It's just the application of laissez-faire capitalism. You know, laissez-faire capitalism is 
Um, one could say maybe it's the theory behind agorism, and agorism is just the actual practice of it. That's simple. Uh -huh. Very good. Well, the only warning caveat I have against your electronic banking, although it's coming, there's nothing we can do about it, is uh, every time I see a www, I see the Hebrew letters vav, 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 which correlate to 666. Just putting it out there, gentlemen. And gold and silver do have intrinsic value. It's highly malleable. I can make my own cups and plates out of it. But Neither that's not intrinsic value. Um, it, well, it's to him. I mean, he values it. I mean, that's but that's not intrinsic. The definition of intrinsic means it's there regardless. But no money has intrinsic value. All value is subjective because it exists only in the minds of people. Even gold and silver. Even gold and silver. All right, which means that if somebody, say, can't afford gold and silver to hoard up in their home and instead they go out and they buy those little mini bottles of alcohol and store those up, you know, if the coming apocalypse leaves people without a way to go out down to the bar, then you're going to have something to value. Sure. <laughs> I'd like to address one of the concerns of the uh, gentleman that just called in. He, um, he, he's, you know, he seemed to be a little uh, uh, hesitant of electronic currencies. And I can totally sympathize with that. Um, you know, there definitely is a big push by the, you know, the governments of the world to centralize the currency into, like, the global currencies and then also at the same time, you know, make everything electronic so there is no more cash transactions, which means they'll be able to see every single transaction that we make, which is, which is really scary, and I'm against that. Um, unfortunately, Bitcoin is different in that when you send, uh, when you send payment or Bitcoin to and from other individuals, it's, it's what's considered anonymous. Now, it doesn't have to be completely anonymous. There are ways to discover who's sending Bitcoins to who. However, there is the option that you can make it as anonymous as you'd like. It's just as anonymous as cash. So um, it's, not, it's not like you're sending it from one bank account to another. That, oh, Seth sent money to Sam. It's, it's you know, 578B uppercase C sent it to, you know, just this random line of digits. So... Uh, it, it's a fully anonymous currency, so it, that should help alleviate some right. of the fears. That's a, that's a really good point, Seth. It's sort of the counter to the centralized electronic currencies that the governments are trying to create, right? So you, the governments are centralizing these currencies and controlling them and monitoring every detail, where Bitcoin is an electronic currency, but it's the, it's the yin to the yang, I guess. Absolutely. All right, 458-TALK is the number we go to the next caller. Good morning. Who's this? This is Maria. Maria, what's on your mind? Hey, I appreciate the show. I, I hear what you're saying. Um, I, I can't remember your first name. What, what's the name of the guest? Seth. I hear what you're saying, Seth, um, and I'm real curious how well developed the system is for redeeming uh, the bit points. Um, what do you mean by redeeming? Uh, using them for trade. Well, it's still in its infancy. Uh, the currency came out in 2010. And um, so it's only a couple years old. However, more and more individuals are discovering it, and they're deciding to uh, implement it into their business. So, you know, a lot of people aren't necessarily going to go 100% to Bitcoin. So let's say you, you, you run a small mom and pop shop or a business. Um, you might not be able to totally reject the dollar yet, unfortunately. I mean, that's the goal is to totally be able to reject all of government currency. Um, however, you know, you could offer, and a lot of people are, offering Bitcoin as payment alongside dollars. You know, and that's, to that's not totally unheard of. I mean, I remember when I, uh, when I visited Europe, you know, over a decade ago, that, you know, before they had the euro, there was often times that, you know, you'd go, and you'd go to a menu at a restaurant or something, and they'd say, yeah, it's this many Deutschmarks and it's this many dollars, and they'd gladly take both. So, I mean, that's, it, it's not the most developed, but it's, it's getting more and more developed every day. Okay, thank you. And, and and basically, Seth, what you're talking about there, too, would be that if somebody here locally said, uh, for instance, I'm willing to accept Bitcoins for my goods, you know, especially if it's something like raw milk or uh, eggs or something that the government would pounce beer. all over you for, it, beer, if it, oh, yeah, you bring up what I make. Thank yep. you very much. Yeah. Is she still on? Uh, Maria, are you still there? I am, uh-huh. I wondered if you wanted to say something real quick about... Uh, uh, I think it's the march against the uh, oh the NDA, NDA. yeah. Protest if you want to say Sunday. something? Sure, that's great. I appreciate that. It's a, a tax day this year, um, protesting NDAA, and it's at Veterans Park, and uh, everybody's welcome. We have all sorts of people joining us. So, uh, two o'clock. Which park is that again? Uh, the one on Cushman, where the occupiers are. Okay. 
So now are you joining in the occupiers or are you counter-occupying? What's the? We sure are. They're joining us for our protest. We all have really a uh, lot of shared interest. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Amazing Thanks. to think that somebody with a tea party would get it together with people from Occupy Fairbanks. What 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 is the world coming to? Well, apparently no one likes to be indefinitely detained, Steve. Oh, really? <laughs> you know, you know. Here, that side note uh, on this issue of uh, people associating with Occupy Fairbanks, or on the other side, people associating with the Tea Party. There, one of the founders. I mean, I think it was Benjamin Franklin said, "We all have to hang together, or we'll <laughs> hang separately." Yeah. And and those of you who are out there advocating for the Occupy Fairbanks to get evicted from the park. Those of you who are out there arguing that we should not affiliate with them, you may be getting them hanged, but you are going to be next on the list, brother. 458-TALK is the number. Good morning, caller. Welcome to Patriots Lament. Who's this? Hello, this is Charles the Poet. Charles, what's on your mind today? A couple of obscure references again. Uh, Pierre Proudhon, the guy who said uh, private property is theft, was the first one. He declared he was the first one that called himself an anarchist. And another reference, uh, of course, it's English, uh, Percy Shelley's poem, The Mask of Anarchy. I suggest you read that, and uh, I'll make it short. And I'll, Thanks for the show, Steve. Thanks very much for calling in. appreciate so, your call. So Proudhon did say that, but he also said property is liberty. So the point he was making is a little bit more subtle than is more co- is, is commonly quoted. Um, he the, It's true that traditional anarchists uh, didn't believe in property, Traditional anarchists, like the first anarchists, were more leftist, um, and a lot of them didn't believe in property, or at least in uh, they believed in like having personal possessions, but not property. But, but they're more commune. How, how many of our elected politicians right now believe in your right to have property? I would say none of them do, or else they would not be supporting property tax. They would not be supporting tax on your labor. They believe in my right to rent property from them. Exactly. They believe in their divine right to rule us and to fund their rule by taking from us whatever they deem necessary to fund whatever it is they're going to do. Because, of course, they are the almighty, powerful Oz. I'm sorry. Was that a little too uh, over the top there? You still with us, Seth? Yes, I am. All right. Jump in anytime. Let's go to another call here. Good morning, caller. Welcome to Patriots Lament. Who's this? Hey, this is Roger. Roger, what's on your mind? Well, I was uh, I was thinking my my uh, problem with this bit currency is what if it disappears? What if there's no proof that I had any money? You know, there's, I want something in my hand that proves I own this money. Okay. That's, a, that's an excellent. That's, that's a common that's a common fear. Let me ask you: Do you have any money in a bank account? Yes, I do. What's the, what's what could um, if that's all electronic? That what's, could disappear. What's your proof? What, what's your proof that you have any money in your bank account? Yeah, you can't hold that in your hand. Well, I only keep a certain amount in my bank account so I can buy gas without going into the store. Um, but I like the uh, AOCS. The, I guess it's the American Open Currency Standard, and they uh, they basically mint coins out of gold, silver, and copper. And uh, I, I went into a coin shop a while back and uh, talked to a guy about it, and uh, he kind of laughed and said it's a big scam. And um, and I said, uh, well, I didn't really want to get too deep into it with him. I didn't have a lot of time, but he said, you're buying these these copper coins, and they are not worth the amount of money that you're putting into it. And I, I was just thinking, what? How much is a paper dollar worth? You know, how much is paper worth? He was talking about the value of the copper. I mean, that's something I can hold in my hand and uh, got some value rather than a piece of paper. When that collapses, it's only yeah. good for making fires. I, I understand that. That makes sense. Um, and there's, you know, you can have you can have physical currencies that you can hold if you want. Um, but I, I would be careful about completely rejecting electronic currency, even though it's intangible. Uh, the world is moving that way more and more. Um, and I don't think even Seth, you don't um, you don't tell people to put everything that they own, currency-wise, into a Bitcoin, right? No, I mean what yeah. I what I did was I said to myself, okay, what are, what is my real fear of Bitcoin? You know, and I and at the end of the day, I was like, okay, there's only one real fear, and that is all of my money going to zero. <laughs> I mean, it's that simple. <laughs> I just I don't want to wake up one day and find out all my money. And then I realized, I said, okay, well, I don't necessarily need to keep 
ten thousand dollars in Bitcoin. You know, I can I can have just like he said, he keeps just enough money in his bank account to buy gas and incidental. You know, and the rest of it he can put into gold and silver and bury it somewhere. I mean, that's that's what I think a really smart move, to be honest. Uh, yeah. I would recommend have you know a few hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin. You know, when you get paid in Bitcoin, you know, uh, you know, or if you make money in Bitcoin, you turn around and you spend it on you know in Bitcoin and. Whatever you want to have as your savings, you know, for when you're 60 years old and you retire, you know, buy some gold and silver. I mean, even, even you know, gold and silver, yes, its, it's value is imputed, um, and it might not ever be a global currency again for a number of reasons. However, they still do serve, you know, purposes in electronics and these sorts of things. So, you know, go ahead and buy it as precious metals and bury it somewhere safe and, and just, use, just use Bitcoin as a everyday sort of transaction currency. You know, at least you know that, you know, the money that's sitting in your Bitcoin account isn't being devalued every single day by the master counterfeiters in Washington, D.C. You know that much. Right. I, I see Bitcoins as sort of a, an addition to precious metals. I don't think it's going to ever replace them. Now, now, going back to what this caller had mentioned about the Amer- the open currency standard, and now can't you get in trouble if somebody catches you using a currency other than American currency? Um. The, the laws are kind of vague on this. There was a guy who was uh, minting silver dollars a few years ago. Uh, I think his name was... Uh, do you, Seth, do you remember his name? The no- Bernard von Nothaus? Yeah, Nothaus. And he got in trouble. Um, I, if I remember correctly, it's because his, cur- his currency had a lot of American symbols on them. Like it said, we trust in God, and it had Lady Liberty and, and stuff like that. But at the and same time... it was t- called the Liberty Dollar. It was called the I mean, Liberty uh, Dollar. Yeah. And it was, so there was the, the case was that he was trying to more or less counterfeit or, or replicate or, you know, defraud people by calling it the dollar. But Bitcoin doesn't look or, I mean, it's totally nothing compared to the dollar. So, right. I mean, it's its own thing. But you know that, um, that, that that guy was completely exonerated, right? He They said there was nothing that he did wrong, but they still confiscated all of his gold exactly. and silver. Exactly. And uh, he never well, saw it again, but they said, okay, you're free to go, there's... You've done nothing wrong. It didn't say um, what what was the thing that they that they uh, they called it a, a unique form of economic terrorism. <laughs> economic terrorism. Yeah, I, I think that's yeah. what they're doing at the at the Federal Reserve. That's exactly what they're doing at the Federal Reserve. Well, that's the that's the beautiful thing about Bitcoin is that there's it's it's not centrally located. There's no warehouse or uh, location they bank or anything they can go to and then uh, freeze your account or steal everybody's gold or silver. The, the currency is, is literally backed up by every single person who uses it and runs the software. So uh, there's, there's really nothing. If they came in and, and if the Fed came into your house and stole your computer, um, they still couldn't get your currency if you had it backed up somewhere else. You know, so, you know, you can fully encrypt it so that they can't even touch it without the password and all that. I mean, there's, it's a very, very secure currency. It's a very As robust, fact, and, yeah. You know, there's, there's people say, oh, what if the government outlaws it? I say, go ahead, let, them, let the government totally ban it. Like front door cracked open. It's not going anywhere. You might go to prison, though. <laughs> well, you know, they ban, uh, they ban, for example, the federal government bans um, uh, file sharing, BitTorrent. Millions of people all over the world every single day download music and movies, and there's nothing they can do about it because the government is, just like another criminal organization, they don't have the resources. They simply don't have the resources to throw tens of millions of people in prison. They simply don't. I mean, they're already maxed out with three million. You know, so, I mean, that's the thing is, sure, they might, they might go after a couple of key people just to make an example out of them, but there's no way they're going to arrest and kidnap every single big person. That's just not, never going to happen. All right. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna get off here, but thanks for I the call. I, I completely support you guys, and uh, thanks for what you're doing. Yeah, appreciate that. You know, it, it's interesting here. Before we go to the next call, I, I was talking with uh, one of our borough assembly members uh, this week, who is absolutely fed up with what the borough is doing right now. Like we put, we talked about earlier with the the taxes and the increases and the not giving a break to people who are destitute, but but basically insisting on their right to take away their property. And uh, she's advocating for people to not participate, to claim absolutely every exemption that you possibly can on your taxes to help starve the beast. And and another great way of doing that is to not use the beast's currency. Absolutely. I think one of the greatest things about bitcoins is that uh, the Ben Bernanke's not in charge of it. Right. (laughs) Wait, who is in charge of it? 
No everybody one. that you everyone. Have. No one and everyone. Ooh. Yep. Peaceful, Four, voluntary <laughs> Peaceful voluntary exchange. What kind of anathema is this? <laughs> Four five eight dog is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Yeah, this is Chris. Chris, what's on your mind? Oh, I just I just had a question, and then I'll, I'll hang up and listen for an answer. But this Bitcoin currency, it, 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 I mean, you know, anybody could have thought this up. I mean, has anybody thought that maybe uh, our government could have thought this up, and then everybody will put their drop dollars into bit currency and then they just drop an EMP or something like that, wipe out the entire computer system and nobody has nothing. So there's a... Uh, actually... and, then, and, then, and then they make it look like a terrorist attack. You know? Right. So... And, and then, you, I mean, essentially you didn't have anything, but there's a lot of people out there that would go and put tangible items that turn around and our government will be saying afterwards is good currency and you just paid off the Chinese debt. Right. taxes essentially by by doing these other services when free trade essentially would just be hey trade something for something i mean it's a, you need something the only thing of value is something that you actually need to survive in this world so but my my concern with bit currency would be that it, it just sort of is a is a is a hoax okay i'll tell you it's not a hoax um some people have speculated that maybe the government did create it but it doesn't matter <laughs> Because, uh, as Seth said earlier, all the source code is available online. Anybody can go and look at the source code. And uh, most of us probably couldn't look at it and understand what it is. But I, I, I know a little bit of programming, and I know programmers who have looked at it. And it's it's all on the up and up. It's all legitimate. Um, it's it's very validated by a lot of different people. Um, and, and the thing is, there's no way for the government to go and, and drop an EMP and shut down the servers because there's no Bitcoin servers. It's what's called a peer-to-peer -peer network. So the Bitcoin software is run on per people's personal computers. And uh, so the size of the network is, is huge at this point. It's, it's larger than, like, the world's top four or five supercomputers combined. But what, what would be necessary, basically? You know, You'd you would have to shut down everybody's computer running the, the network. If there were a big enough EMP event, would that do that? Would that you'd, completely knock out? You'd have knockout? to shut down everything else, though. You'd have to shut down the, an EMP to take out bitcoins would shut down the government's computers. It would shut down everybody's computers. It would shut down the Internet. So basically, the, 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 the whole issue of currency would be completely gone anyway yes, because right lose, now all, all other currencies are electronic. The, the United States government would lose all of its money in bank accounts. The Federal Reserve's, you know, everything would go yeah everything that at which point you'd be back to barter anyway everything right. that callers have called about with concerns with the bitcoins is absolutely happening right now with federal reserve notes mm -hmm. there's no difference i mean you have electronic you don't have five thousand dollars in cash money at the bank you have no, i mean digits all these people's concerns are valid and i had the same concerns when i first discovered it but i'm i'm fully convinced it's not a hoax there is a lot i mean it's a pretty the idea behind bitcoins is pretty simple but it's a pretty complex um, concept like if you want to get into the technical details of how the Bitcoin network has run, you have to understand cri cryptography, you have to understand public and private keys, and a lot of uh, really technical stuff which we can't get into on the air. But if anybody's curious, you know, um, come to the come to the Patriots Lament uh, dot blogspot dot com website and we can we can talk about it. I mean, I can give you the, the technical details if you want it. Um, but without you know without understanding the technical details, I can see why people might be a little bit sketchy uh, you know sketchy about it. But it's well, it's, Seth, you were uh, you had your uh, misgivings about it originally, didn't you? I think yeah, I did. I mean, w you know, when it came out in early 2010 or whatever, um, I was a hard money guy. You know, I was all about gold and silver, and I was a you know at that time I wasn't an anarchist yet. I was still very much you know uh, or maybe I was an anarchist around that time, but you know I was still very much a Ron Paul supporter, and I you know. You know, I really bought into the whole money is gold and silver and that sort of thing. And, and um, so I kind of wrote it off as just another fiat currency, you know, blah. And, but it wasn't for, you know, and I kept um, dismissing it. And there was more and more libertarians and anarchists who were saying, hey, this is a good currency, this is a good currency. And I kept dismissing it. And finally one day I thought to myself, you know, Seth, I like to consider myself a person with an open mind. And I feel like every time I diss on Bitcoin, I feel like there's this nagging bit in my, my conscience saying, you haven't given it a fair chance. And so finally one day I said, all right, I'm going to be open-minded about it, and I'm going to really look into Bitcoin. I'm going to look into, you know, everything, learn everything I can about it and see if it's legit. And after I spent a lot of time researching it, I came out of it with my mind blown. I was like, wow, this is really, this is probably what's going to save humanity. Seriously. I mean, it's, 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 a very, it's something I'm very excited about. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I had my, I, I was skeptical at first too, but once I learned the nature of the system and, and the nature of money and all these things, I, I came out very, very positive on Bitcoin. 458-TALK is the number. We move on to the next caller. Good morning. Welcome to Patriots Lament. Who's this? 
Uh, this is Don. Don, what's on your mind? Uh, hey, uh, I just uh, <clears throat> kind of it's just kind of interesting the conversation, the whole thing on this thing deal is. But uh, the thing that really uh, upsets me, and that's this uh, electronic stuff that's going on. Uh, when are we going to get out there and get our little tattoo engravers and put the six 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 on our forehead and our arm? Because to me, it's just, uh, this is just absurd. This is stuff that's being happening. Um, uh, I know a lady right now that's sitting there. She's fighting the fact that they're going to mandate her Social Security be electronically deposited into a checking account that she doesn't want to do business with a bank because she's had her identity stolen years ago and took her seven years to get it restored. And uh, it, this is absurd, the, the, this electronic stuff. As far as I'm concerned, it's just like they say, a click of a button, it can all disappear. So, so yeah, I mean, we, we discussed this a little bit earlier, and your concerns are valid. Um, the Technology is a blessing and a curse, right? It's like a, a gun can be used for good or evil. Technology can be used for good or evil. And the government is trying to use it to track us, to monitor us, to spy on us, to control us, to manipulate us. To take your money. To take our money, to, you know. to, to control our bank accounts. And so technology can be used for evil like you're talking about. it. They could, they could embed chips in all of us that, you know, have a unique identification that tells them all the information about us. They can do that um, with technology. But at the same time, you can use technology to fight back. And so I want to, I want to make sure people aren't conflating Bitcoin technology with the government's invasive technologies. Bitcoin is the antithesis of the government's invasive technology. Bitcoin is part of the technology that helps you get out of that. It's part of the technology that helps you stay anonymous, helps you get out of the central banking system, um, and protects you from this from this it, government it manipulation. It creates non-trackable transactions. Uh, um, my other uh, take on this, too, they say that they're doing this uh, to stop mailing these checks out to people who save them millions of dollars. Uh, I don't believe that. From from the get go, because to me, all the setup for all this electronic stuff isn't going to be cheap. Are you talking about the government once again? The government, the social security. Yeah, yeah I don't, I don't know. The electronic, the, this the deposit stuff, they mandate and all that stuff. So, well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, Webster. Um, pretty much any time the government does something, it's expensive and it sucks. Thanks for the show, you guys. Catch thanks for the call. But but the beautiful thing about Bitcoin is that um, I mean, there's a million beautiful things about Bitcoin, but one of the nice things about Bitcoin is that you can send Bitcoins from, from you know, Sam can send me Bitcoins from Alaska to where I am in New Hampshire, and there is zero fee on it. There's no PayPal 3%. There's no credit card 3%. There's, and there's, and it's, fast. It, it, it's fast. It's fast. I mean, it, it doesn't take 24 hours. It's immediate, and it doesn't cost anything. There's nobody siphoning off, you know, a percentage because there's no central server. It's just a peer-to-peer network. So you're going to save, even if all you did... Even if you don't understand the currency, you don't care about it, even if all you did was just started accepting it for your online transactions, maybe you sell something over the Internet, right off the bat you're going to be saving yourself 3% in processing fees every single transaction. Right. So uh, we've got to wrap up here, Seth, but you want to give a quick plug for the Free State Project because you're in New Hampshire, right? Yeah, I'm in New Hampshire. I've been here for, uh, what, six or eight months now. I uh, moved from California, escaped, I should say, from California. <laughs> Absolutely love it in New Hampshire. I mean, it is it is it's a beautiful state out here, and I love living in a state where liberty-minded individuals are fleeing to instead of from. So. All right. It's growing there, too, isn't it? Absolutely. We're getting yeah. new movers every single day. All right. So action points today would be to check out Bitcoin technology. And uh, the the website there, Bitcoin.org, is that where people would go to learn more about that? Yeah, that's a that's a good start. You can pretty much Google bitcoins, and there's a lot of uh, like start Kickstart tutorials. And and the other one would be to check out Seth King's website, DailyAnarchist.com. Yep. All right. Thanks yeah. again, Seth King, for being with us on the air today. This has been Patriots Lament, and uh, here in just moments, we are going to move on to our next Saturday show, Health Talk, at 11 o'clock. Contact information for Patriots Lament is uh, email is patriotslament.gmail.com at, 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 at gmail.com. Sorry, and uh, online it's patriotslament.blogspot.com. Yep. And you can also check us out on YouTube with Radio the, Free Fairbanks. Radio Free Fairbanks is the channel. Sam, Josh, thanks for being here. Thanks, we'll Steve. see you next week on Patriots Lament right here on KFAR Local Talk Radio. Check us out online as well, KFAR660.com, right there on the World Wide Web.